everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Leslie. Uh, I work on the ACT Google team here in London. Uh, we're always on the lookout for great speakers, writers, um, to come to talk to us. So if there's anyone that you guys have, um, you know, any suggestions or ideas or anything, just please email speakers-suggest at google.com and we'll get back to you. Um, our speaker today is Gavin Teacher Kitty, author of The Cloud Sweater's Guide and most recently, uh, The Cloud Collective Handbook. Uh, we've had politicians, novelists, journalists, and environmentalists come to talk to us in the past, but I think this is a genuine first to be welcoming someone whose chosen pastime is to collect bits of the atmosphere. Uh, we know that British people are a bit obsessed with the weather, but they don't often stop to think where it comes from. Gavin's mission is to change this through his books and the society he wrote, the Cloud Appreciation Society. Gavin passionately believes that clouds, far from being just bringers of the rain, are a beautiful part of the skies. He's here to convince us that a better understanding of the clouds can be beneficial to the soul. I won't preempt anything else he has to say, so without further ado, please welcome Gavin. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's right. Uh, I, I thought Nishia talked a little bit about this book. Well, in fact, really, it is about this book that I'm, um, that I'm here because this is a collection of photographs um, sent in by members of the Cloud Appreciation Society. Uh, and I've got together a bunch of our favourite ones to illustrate each of the different clouds and uh, written a little bit about each. So I thought maybe before we did anything, I just ought to give a bit of context to this and explain what the Cloud Appreciation Society is and how it started and stuff like that. Um, it started a few years ago, 2006, um, and uh, somebody asked me to give a talk at a literary festival. She knew that I was into clouds. This is before I'd written a book or there was any society. She asked me to give a talk uh, about clouds. I said I'd love to, but I was worried that when I gave the talk, people wouldn't um, come. Because in this country, we all complain about clouds too much. Um, uh, you know, we complain about something being a cloud on the, uh, hanging over them, a cloud on the horizon, and so on. Um, so I gave it a weird name. I said it's the, I called it the inaugural lecture of the Cloud Appreciation Society, just to sound weird. What do you mean? Sound like an intriguing idea, and it worked. And everyone afterwards said, "How do I join your society?" I thought, "Well, actually, maybe let, let, I should have a society." And it started kind of like that in this sort of weird way, and then I had no ambitions for it. It just it grew um, organically, really. Um, and when you get a uh, when you become a, a member, you get a badge, uh, and you also get a certificate with your name on it, um, uh, and your sort of membership number. Uh, it says we do hereby certify that the person's name was elected as a member of the society on the day and will henceforth seek to persuade all who listen of the wonder and beauty of clouds. So this is part of the society is this campaigning thing that actually clouds aren't something we should complain about. Actually clouds are one of the most beautiful parts of nature in constant flux and change, one of the most poetic aspects of our world around us. And if you live in a place uh, where, where there are a lot of clouds, it's really such a silly idea to spend all your time wishing you lived in Southern California or the middle of Australia where there are no clouds. Um, you know, I think by getting to know the different characters in the sky, and that's what this handbook is about, is getting to know all the different kind of characters, some of which you see on a regular basis, some of which make very rare appearances. By getting to know them, then you begin to appreciate what's around you every day and find the beauty in the every day, which I think is a really good thing. That's a good thing for you. It's a good thing for the soul to uh, to do that. And when um, I did the first book, Cloud Spotter's Guide, lots of people said, well, it'd be nice to have something to carry around, and why isn't there more colour in it and stuff? And that's really what sort of motivated doing this book. And it was partly inspired by I Spy books. Can you remember those? <laughs> Only people in the UK will know them. Um, they uh, had this points system. So you said sort of spotting. You would go out and you would spot various things, and when you saw it, you'd get points for it. And kids said, you know, it was something that would, you, you, I remember when I was young, people were talking about it and you'd collect it. I sort of like that nerdy thing, you know what I mean, of getting points. And so I thought, have they done one on the sky? And they had, but it was only stars. 
So, you know, no competition there. I thought, how much is a big gap in the market? Uh, and so there's an element to this, which is a game where you get points for the different clouds you spot. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go along. First cloud. Um, I don't know if people know about clouds here at Google. Does anyone know what this cloud is? Put your hand up if you do. No, okay. ah. it's, a, it's a cumulus cloud. Well done. I think you can get a, um, get a five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that's a cumulus cloud. 15 points. <laughs> not a very high score because 15, uh, 15 you'll see, is not a particularly high score. That's because these are quite common clouds um, and they're also, you know, the scoring is not to do with um, whether, you know, whether I like this cloud or not. It's to do with generally how common they are. Because uh, I love this cloud, um, and it's a very kind of light-hearted cloud. It's a fair weather cloud. It forms on a sunny day, cotton wool drifting along in the breeze as you sit down on lying your back in the park. Um, so, for, you know, if it was to do with appreciation, I'd give it higher points. Uh, the good thing about humans as well is that they're very good clouds for finding shapes in. Um, and you know, one of the things that when members send in uh, cloud photographs, one of the things I love, and one of the things I encourage them to do is send in clouds in the shape of things. Um, and this was a one from a while ago, the Michelin man with a gun. <laughs> perform a robbery of some sort. And then recently I got another one in um, from another member who uh, it was clearly, it was a sort of later photograph, like a CCTV camera photograph, later in the incident. It isn't making the getaway. <laughs> um, <laughs> he nicked some candy floss by the looks of it. Um, and then uh, that cumulus cloud is one of the ten main types. There are ten main groups of cloud. Another is the stratus cloud, a low layer of cloud. Um, and when it's down on the ground, this is a cloud you call foot. Um, 15 points. Quite a common one in this country, some would say too common. Um, it's not very, uh, it doesn't give much variety to the sky, and that is one of the great things about clouds, in my opinion. I find blue skies boring, of course, a completely flat overcast sky is boring. But the great thing about clouds is they bring kind of variety and a kind of architecture to our atmosphere, make it feel like a three dimensional thing rather than a two dimensional thing. Um, so, clumpy clouds, layered clouds, cumulus and stratus, and then the other sort of main type is these cirrus clouds. Oh, I was going to ask you what those were, cirrus, <laughs> you've given the answer already. Um, don't see quite so many of those, because they're often kind of hidden by the, the low clouds we get in this country. A lot of, so you get 20 points for those, 5 points more. Um, and you can get bonus points as well. So if you manage to see a cirrus uncinus, which uh, has this hooked appearance, like commas or like hooks, you get a bonus of 15 points. Um, so, uh, and then another type. Anyone know what this type of cloud is? It's a man pointing at a rabbit eating the sun. <laughs> uh, and then off in the distance there is some of this type, the strontic cumulus. So this is another one of the main types of clouds. Sometimes when uh, you can join the terms together. So stratus and cumulus joined together make stratus cumulus because it's a layer of clumpy cloud. Uh, and that's kind of partly how the system works. Alto cumulus clumps at a higher level. There's a mid-level cloud. Alto stratus, the most boring cloud, as it's described <laughs> as. But it's, again, it's a kind of overcast sky and um, doesn't really produce rain, doesn't really do anything. It sort of hangs around like a kind of unwanted guest at a party or something. Uh, cirrocumulus, high little clumps of cloud, um, so high up that they look almost like grains of salt or something like that. Cast or confetti cast across the sky um, for some celestial wedding. Um, and then high layers uh, like cirrostratus, this cloud here, um, these are composed of ice crystals rather than water droplets, which the lower clouds tend to be. Middle clouds are often a mixture of the two, and ice crystals can, in certain situations, be like tiny prisms. Each crystal acts like a tiny prism. The light comes through it, 
and is refracted and reflected as it passes through. And they can produce these effects known as halo effects, this um, uh, halo phenomenon. Uh, this halo phenomenon here is called a 22 degree halo. Rather romantic name. Uh, and then, you know, another one of the ten main types is the Nimbostratus, the most hated cloud, the one that gives all the other clouds a bad name. Uh, well, this is the one that's a drizzle cloud. It hangs around for ages and it's a kind of constant ongoing rain. So, you know, I can't remember how many points you get for this cloud, but it's certainly not a large, not a large. I think you get ten bonus points if it uh, was responsible for ruining your weekend on the seaside. <laughs> As a kind of consolation. Apology, really. Um, okay, what about this one? Anyone know what this cloud is called? Is that the uh, cumulo, cumulo nimbus? Yeah, he said that down in the back. Yeah, absolutely. Can you come and collect your um, bag? Come and see me after. Um, <laughs> No, it's waiting for you. Um, Cumulo Nimbus, exactly right. It's the storm cloud. Um, and this is uh, it's actually related to the cumulus cloud at the beginning, the fluffy fair weather one. But it's enormous. It's grown out of that. And it, when the, the environment is un unstable, it's unstable atmosphere, these clouds can grow and they spray, spray out at the top into a, an anvil. Um, 40 points for that one. <laughs> uh, partly because, you know, to see one uh, have a good vista on it like this, you need to be some distance away, you need to have clear sky between you and the cloud. Normally you see this cloud over the top of you and it's just a dark, ominous sky and the rain can come suddenly or the snow, whatever it is, or the hail, you can get a sudden heavy shower. But to see one from the distance like that, it looks quite... Well, it looks quite sort of graceful almost. You mean up at the top, many of ice crystals up at the top. But it's a powerful cloud, <coughs> as you can see by this sort of muscly arm. Does that work? <laughs> <laughs> no, really. But anyway, it looks like a certain arm wrestle. Anyway, um, so the idea of collecting clouds, I thought I'd just talk about that a little bit, because it sounds like a sort of stupid idea, doesn't it? It sounds like you, know, you can't own a cloud. You can't buy one. You can't put it in a display cabinet. You can't swap it with someone else's cloud. So it sounds like a rubbish idea for making a collection of. But for those precise reasons is why I quite like the idea of having a collection of clouds. I like the fact that they're so ephemeral and passing and ungraspable that they sort of represent moments, moments in your day or moments that you remember, that maybe you photographed one and you captured a meteorological moment. And so to kind of collect clouds and to collect different ones and spot different ones and maybe photograph them, maybe just write it down in a book or maybe just remember it, is a kind of collection of memories, which I sort of like. I think it's more honest in a way than many collections because nothing lasts forever. Everything goes eventually and it crumbles to dust. Uh, clouds just do it off the so, what is worth 45 points? Uh, it is none other than the lenticularis cloud, which looks like a UFO. Um, these are often, uh, they form in, often in mountainous regions, and you get, they look like these sort of lozenges. And as the, as a kind of moist air stream flows along and hits the mountain, it's forced to rise up to get over it. And sometimes in certain conditions, it can kind of go up and down, dip up and down in the lee of the mountain. And at the crest of each of these invisible waves of air, a cloud can fall, a lenticularis cloud. Um, these are species, so these are kind of subdivisions of the main types that I showed you before. Another species um, is undulatus, kind of wave-like undulations. Um, sometimes they're kind of ridiculously regular like that one. Sometimes they're a bit more like ripples in the sand. Like this. Um, moon there, just appearing, in, uh, peeking through. And then the lachanosis cloud has holes in it. Unusual cloud. Don't see that very often, so you get a good 40 points for that one. Sometimes these um, points are because you have to be in a certain area, like, you know, the lenticularis ones, the ones that look like UFOs, you generally see those more often when you're in mountainous areas 
So that's why you don't get so you get it's quite a lot of points for it. This one is quite a passing flag. It's fleeting. It's ephemeral. It doesn't hang around for long. Uh, it's a sort of transitional flag. So that's another reason why you get good points. Radiatus radiating out um, because it's the, because it's cloud, high cloud like this cirrus clouds get off to the distance in streaks can the uh, the, uh, the, the the perspective makes it look like it's radiating from the distance. Um, so there are also a number of clouds which are not any of the main groups or genera, they're not any of the species, the subdivisions, but they're known as, or they're not the varieties, which are other divisions, they're known as the accessory clouds or supplementary features, and they're like the hangers-on to some of the other cloud, cloud types. They're kind of an entourage uh, of one of the main types. So here you've got the Pileus cloud, like a kind of cap or like a sort of weird, I suppose it's, that's quite a fancy hat, isn't it, really? Something your mother-in-law might wear to the wedding or something. So they look like a hat, and, and this, in this case it's a bit like the lenticular clouds. You have an airstream, and here it has to rise to pass over the top of a big cloud building up below. So it's not a mountain it's passing over, it's another cloud, and all the air, hot air rising up in the centre of the cloud, forces this airstream to rise, and as it rises, it cools, and whenever air rises and cools, there's more likelihood of some bits of moisture forming into droplets and appearing as cloud. That's how it happens. Cloud is usually to do with air rising and droplets forming. Other supplementary features like that are these great mama clouds. Pouches, they look like pouches. In fact, uh, the Latin mama comes from the word for udders, and these sometimes fall and form on the underside of uh, the anvil at the top of those wide uh, spreading uh, layers at the top of st storm clouds. Uh, and then storm clouds, the accumulate in the storm clouds, produce a lot of these um, sort of additional bits. Another is arcus, which is like the front bumper of the clouds. It comes kind of rolling along. You've got that front edge down below is an arcus. And of course, tuba. Is uh, when you have uh, a rotation of uh, the rising air goes into a vortex, and then you've got cap clouds. These are other clouds. These are the ones that um, it's like a lenticular, but it it's sort of over the top of a mountain. So that really is a fancy mother-in-law hat. So it's just really trying to sort of steal the show from the bride. Um, a cloud we see more and more of these days is a man-made cloud. Called contrails. So common are these that they earn very few points. I can't remember how many. Um, yeah, 100 years ago, there were no contrails in the sky. Um, and now they are, you know, ubiquitous. They're in every, uh, you know, over every major continent in the world. And uh, interestingly, over the United States, uh, uh, after the 9 11 atrocities, when there were no flights for three days, Scientists are able to compare the temperatures when these contrails were not present with the previous 40 years, the same days of the year, when they have always been there. And it seems these contrails have an effect on our temperatures. So many people kind of wonder with so many of these contrails around and the way they spread out to form other high clouds, you know, whether they are sort of exacerbating some of the, the warming trends. Full streak hole. When part of a cloud freezes and its ice crystals grow uh, at the expense of the water droplets, it can, these can then fall below in a, in a full streak. And it's something which is also formed as a, when an aeroplane flies up through a cloud, uh, it can sometimes cause the droplets to freeze and you get these strange sort of holes uh, and effects. Naqueous. Um, even higher up, we are now talking about clouds that are uh, 10 to 15 miles up, um, even 10 to 20, and these are in the stratosphere, not the troposphere, which is where most clouds form. And they have these amazing, be amazingly beautiful colours. Um, they're, they're also known as mother of pearl clouds, because the way the sunlight is diffracted as it passes through and around the crystals, uh, it, it produces these wonderful uh, coloured effects. Um, and then even higher up is noctilucent, 
and not to this cloud, which I think you get all the points for, is 30 to 50 miles up, way higher than all the other clouds, all the weather clouds that we're used to seeing. The not to lose clouds are so high that after the sun's gone down over the horizon, the sky has darkened. It can still catch these clouds up so high that they shine against the dark sky, not to lose them, shining at night. And they have a, a eerie, blue, wavy appearance to them. You see them in the middle of the summer. Now is a good time. We're in June at the moment. Uh, summertime, you see noctilucent clouds. Wintertime, you see nacreous clouds. Both of them, you're more likely to see at higher latitudes. So noctilucent are much more common over Scotland. But I've seen them in Somerset and in the southwest. Um, and then, uh, so find out what we've got. To, I'll show you the two other two other clouds that are in this book. I'll show you which have the highest points. It's always important to know really what the, the jewel in your cloud collection is going to be. Um, one of them worth 50 points. Uh, it's the horseshoe <laughs> It looks like an ups upside down horseshoe. And it kind of rotates as it forms. You don't see many of these around. If you do see one, you'll probably be in a, roughly in the vicinity of a storm, cloud forming, and you should definitely take a picture. <laughs> That's my advice to you, because um, no one will believe you that you've got 50 points without <laughs> photographic evidence. Uh, and they, it seems there's something to do with like a, a, a you know, rising column of air encountering winds up above and being sent over into a kind of vortex. Normally vortices are like that, and this is a kind of vortex that goes like that, with a cloud forming at the top kind of crest of it. Um, and then, the highest score, 55 points, it is, of course, the Kelvin Helmholtz wave cloud. Uh, and I love this cloud not only because uh, it is a dis distinctive cloud, and it's very, very fleeting. It only hangs around briefly, but it's just got such a um, distinctive uh, and beautiful appearance, this breaking wave appearance. And it's, this is all to do with shearing winds above and below the cloud layer. And one, they call, they set up an undulation, like a wave like form within the cloud layer. And if the winds are right, the top of these waves are forced to kind of come over like that, very much like a, a, uh, a breaking wave at the seashore. So uh, it's interesting quite how many waves are going on up in the sky. I've talked about waves quite a lot. It's another thing I'm interested in, another sort of phenomenon that, that, fascinate, that fascinates me, waves. And um, you know, there we have the ocean below and the air above. And the air above is an ocean, like that of water below. It's an ocean which has waves forming it. And it's an ocean which can have layers of stra different strata of, strata of air. And at the division between the two layers, you get waves rather similar to the surface of the water. Um, so I, you know, I think it's very interesting that we are inhabitants of this ocean of air. We're not inhabitants of the ground, though we sort of associate ourselves with living on the ground. We inhabit the atmosphere. And that's something that's easy to forget about because it's so, so concentrated on what's going on down here. You walk around, when you're stressed, you're looking down at the ground, aren't you? So look down at your feet. Uh, and that's another reason I think the whole idea of looking up, reminding yourself of your place um, and your context within the bigger picture is an important idea. And it's also the whole act of looking up so it opens up your chest like a little yoga move kind of thing. And it's kind of looking up, you know, to keep looking up is a phrase, isn't it? It's about sort of being positive. So I'm kind of fighting against this cloud hanging over you thing and thinking you know, there are lots of, kind of positive things about having your head in the clouds. Ironically, to live with your head in the clouds means you have your feet on the ground, I think. Um, so I'm going to talk just about, finally, i end here with a talk, uh, a little bit about this cloud that's not in the book. Uh, and that's because it is not yet an official type of cloud. 
<laughs> but it seems to me that it should be. Um, and this is something, it's a, it's a cloud formation that got sent in by members. First, the first people who I noticed it coming in from were uh, some members and people in uh, Cedar Rapids in Iowa in the States. Uh, and has this very kind of um, dramatic uh, wave-like formation. Um, this one's from New Zealand. Uh, they just didn't seem to, when I saw these clouds, they didn't really seem to fit within any of the existing cloud types. Uh, undulatus is a, you know, means wave-like, so there's certainly kind of a sort of wave action going on there. Uh, and then, you know, this is in a mountainous area. I think some of these are sort of, these waves are set up, set off by mountains. But <clears throat> there's a very kind of turbulent, confused sort of nature of it. It's not like kind of gentle undulations that you often see in a calm sky. So these, um, these sort of turbulent, chaotic, confused waves in the clouds, I thought didn't fit within any of the existing terms, and I thought, you know, maybe there's an argument for a new variety of cloud. Uh, what would you do if you had a new variety of cloud? Do you, you know, how do you go about saying there should be a new name? I've seen these and thinking that it looked like you were underwater, looking up at the surface of the water, maybe you were snorkeling or something. I initially called them the Jacques Cousteau cloud. <laughs> you know, after the, after the French diver. And um, but then I thought, that's probably not, doesn't sound very official, kind of a Latin term, sound official. Um, what to call it? <laughs> <laughs> so I, asked, I called up my cousin, uh, uh, who's a Latin teacher, and I said, listen, how do you, um, can you think of a good word, a Latin word that I could use for a kind of choppy, rough sea, you know what I mean, where it's all confused? Is there any term like that? And he said, glacialis, chiemts, Aquilonibus aspirate undas. <laughs> I said, it's a bit long. <laughs> he said, no, it's a quotation from Virgil, and it means the waves were roughened by the icy winter's northern gales, in a poem, in a poem Virgil poem. And it uses this term, aspirate, which is roughened, uh, with reference to the sea. Uh, the verb is aspiro, to make rough or uneven. Uh, you would, to get the cloud term, you get the past participle, aspiratus. So that's it. I thought, right, aspiratus cloud. That's what it should be. How about that? New type of cloud. New classification. Um, and then I went to speak to the Royal Meteorological Society here in Britain. I'm not a meteorologist. I've got no background in meteorology. I don't study it or anything like that. I'm just a sort of enthusiast of the of the clouds. So I went to speak to them and said, you know, what, how, how do you go about getting a new name? And they were like, what? So you need a new type of cloud, you know, I think I might find a new type of cloud. They said, well, come along and, you know, present your new type of cloud. Um, we'll see. Uh, so I went along kind of nervously with my photographs and there is a you know, photographs from the members that had sent them in from around the world, showing them and saying, what do you think? Do you think this could be a new type? And they went, hmm. Maybe, maybe you've got a point. And I said, well, what do you have to do? How do you go about <laughs> adding one to the classification system? They said, well, we're not the people to decide whether it should be or shouldn't be. You need to go to the World Meteorological Organization. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're doing at the moment. We're preparing the case to take it to the World Meteorological Organization in Geneva and see what they say. I don't think it's going to happen in a hurry. I mean, it is... It is a kind of the bureaucracy of bureaucracies, um, but that's a plan. Funny thing is that it's all kicked off in the media last week, uh, in spite of the fact that it's still kind of an idea, you know, what would it be like to have a new type of thing. Suddenly everyone got, got, got the hang of it, got hold of it, and I was on the Today program talking about it, you know, uh, having an argument with Michael Fish as to whether it was a new type of cloud or not. And then it was sort of in the newspapers, um, you know, Anonymous, the cloud with no name. Uh, or the Italian, un mistero in cielo, le nuvole senza nome. And then it, uh, it's all brilliant. And then I started doing interviews in the States and in, in Australia, and uh, the Czech Republic became fascinated in this cloud for some reason. 
very pompous. It's all sort of made my website is ground to a halt. Uh, and I did, maybe some Googlers can help me. I don't, I don't know what to do. It's all sort of, you do it, it's like I'm winding it up in the background now. I just think it's really slow and cumbersome. I hope that I'll manage to sort that out. Anyway, that is where the, that's where things stand with that. So we'll, we'll wait and see how that develops. Um, maybe in a future edition, it can be, you know, I can include the Esperantist. So I just thought I'd end uh, to read out the, um, the manifesto of the Cloud Appreciation Society. I think it's really important if you're a society to remind yourself and everyone else what you stand for. And so from an early stage, I wrote the, um, the, the manifesto. And uh, I read it out on a daily basis. <laughs> we believe that clouds are unjustly maligned and that life would be immeasurably, immeasurably poorer without them. We think that clouds are nature's poetry and the most egalitarian of her displays, since everyone can have a fantastic view of them. We pledge to fight blue sky thinking <laughs> wherever we find it. Life would be dull if we had to look up at cloudless monotony day after day. We seek to remind people that clouds are expressions of the atmosphere's moods and can be read like those of a person's countenance. We believe that clouds are for dreamers and their contemplation benefits the soul. Indeed, all who consider the shapes they see in them will save money on psychoanalysis bills. <laughs> And so we say to all who listen, look up, marvel at the ephemeral beauty, and always remember to live life with your head in the clouds. <laughs> Thanks very much. interested in clouds at some stage. But they, I think mean, they, most, most people go through a stage of being interested in clouds. And my first memory was being taken to school by my mum in the back of her mini. Uh, and we were going through London to the school and I remember looking out the window, I was four and a half or something, and seeing uh, this big puffy cloud, which I now know what we call the cumulus cloud, uh, big fluffy, fluffy cloud in front of the sun and these rays of sunlight coming out, which I now know to be called crepuscular rays. Um, so 15 points. Uh, and so the, these, uh, these fingers of sunlight, and you know, it's not coincidental that those, uh, that sort of appearance you have in all those Baroque uh, frescoes in churches in Rome, these, these rays, uh, such a kind of attraction, they, they sort of draw your attention so much. So for some reason, it kind of drew my attention to this cloud, and I thought, what is it? What's it made of? Why does it stay up there? What would it be like to see it? All those things. But I think everyone has a sort of stage they're going through, and then it's sort of, most of us probably have an affection for them buried down below the kind of cynical attitude which we develop as adults when we complain about them. It's a nice day, it's good weather, or it's cloudy weather. Yeah, that's a bad distinction for me. It's often sunny days, good weather days, have fantastic clouds. Uh, the high clouds, the cirrus clouds, don't block the sun. They're just fantastic. They have a fantastic kind of brush stroke appearance across the high sky. So, uh, but just immediately turning to kind of, uh, you know, um, Try to argue for their case, but the point, the answer to your question is when I was about four and a half. <laughs> yeah. Do you find it um, depressing to look at the world through uh, Google Earth? Well, because you think. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, I suppose Google Earth would be not very revealing if um, it took them on to the early days. Yeah, no, good point. Uh, the whole sort of perspective that. Um, satellites have brought on the sky, it's been, it's been very interesting and it has been a kind of revolution in our understanding and our ability to forecast and predict the weather. And it, I think what's interesting about this new cloud time is that it is a direct result of the opposite, which is as a result of the internet bringing people together who have a shared interest, i.e. they're kind of interested in the sky, and also combined with 
digital cameras and how easy it is to carry around a camera and take a picture of the sky and send it in somewhere. Those are together combined to provide this new perspective on the sky, as broad in its reach as a satellite photograph, but in a kind of democratic way. It's been the result of lots of individual photos from people. Each kind of noticing something they like, the photograph they like, and taking a picture of, you know, taking a, 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 a formation that they like. So it's a sort of new perspective. And that's, so this new cloud, whether it ends up being accepted as a new official type or not, I don't think it's a result of, you know, change, you know, uh, global warming, changing weather conditions or anything like that. I think it's just a result of this new perspective on the sky. So that's been facilitated by the internet bringing people together. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the interaction between clouds and climate change? Well, I mean, it is a very interesting interaction and uh, something which uh, scientists are spending a lot of time thinking about and looking at and putting satellites up to study because the clouds are the wild cards in climate change prediction and climate change models because they're very, very complex, they're kind of chaotic things, clouds. We know the processes that produce them very well, but within a, um, a kind of boundless uh, medium like the atmosphere, quite how they, all the interactions work is very complicated and chaotic. And so we don't quite know, firstly, if the, to, as the temperatures warm, does that mean more cloud or less cloud? That's not completely clear. Uh, nor do we know, does that mean more of the lower clouds, the cumulus clouds, say, or the stratocumulus, uh, or does it mean more of the higher clouds, like the cirrus, the wispy ones? And whether that, which one of those it is, uh, would be kind of increasing is, is relevant because they actually have a different effect on temperatures. When you're sitting on the beach and it's a sunny day and a cumulus cloud kind of blows away or blows in front of the sun, you suddenly feel a difference in temperature. It feels cooler. Um, because those low clouds tend to reflect away a lot of the uh, sunlight, more of the sunlight. They're white, they're kind of white, which means that they don't, uh, they, they don't let a lot of the sunlight through, they reflect it away. And the high clouds, on the other hand, like the cirrus, they allow the sunlight, more of the sunlight to come through, but they have a tendency to absorb the heat given off by the Earth, so they act like a, uh, a greenhouse gas. They absorb the Earth's heat and reflect it, and will reflect that back down. So they have a differing kind of um, effect on our temperatures, low clouds and high clouds. So the whole kind of role of clouds in climate change is kind of complex and fascinating, and one that we need to understand more about, and has really established a renaissance of interest in cloud forms and the different ones among scientists. Because with the emergence of uh, the satellite photography, Meteorologists and scientists and weather scientists became a bit less interested in the individual clouds because they're looking at the whole of these enormous weather systems, rotating uh, cyclonic and anticyclonic weather systems. And that was the way to predict. They didn't really, weren't really interested in the individual clouds like I am. And I think it's turning, the tide is turning now uh, as a result of the climate change thing. It's a long answer, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. How do I become a member of our society? Well, you um, maybe wait a few days for the website to be up and working. <laughs> but it's, um, you just go to the website and it's, uh, and it's uh, four pounds life membership. Wow. Uh, whether it's a li your lifetime or the lifetime of the society is yet to be sort of, you know, explained. But I always wanted to keep membership low, the cost, so it's just enough to cover the costs, sending out the certificate and the badge and someone to do the kind of doing it. Uh, and then you get a number. So 16,600 um, or something like that is our number now. We're in, uh, members in 71 countries around the world. And you'd be very welcome to do for the latest edition. And do you know which of your members has the most points? No, it's only just come out. There's no one's had a chance oh, okay. to get points yet. I mean, today is published today. Wow. Uh, so no one's had a chance. Yeah. <laughs> but the maximum number of points you can get is 2,000. And I, I don't know. I, mean, I don't expect anyone to get 2,000 in a hurry. You should make a some, on your website. 
So they get make a race on your website. Yeah, yeah. no, she do. I should come up with some. I mean, I know I've got to come up with some good prize for someone who can get the points back. They get their four points back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. Um, yeah, but you get. To, yeah, it'd be good to have some sort of prize. But people would have to be. They'd have to present me with photographic evidence of all the different types, um, which is. You know, one reason I suppose to take photographs. I mean, in the in the introduction of the book, I say it's not. I don't think it's necessary to take photographs. You don't really have to worry about the different names. You know, I wouldn't want to imply that everyone needs to know all the different types of clouds and the names, because then it all becomes a bit too much like. If you're not careful, it sounds too much like a science lesson, and that you you don't you don't want to lose the kind of carefree um, part of cloud spotting, which is not looking for. You know, particular types or what they mean for the weather. It's just kind of allowing your imagination to wander. So, you know, that, I kind of leave this as a take it or leave it bit of the book. You don't have to take photographs, you don't have to collect points. You can just use it as something to look at one and know what it is. And it's actually in the back, one bit I'm really pleased about is in the back, I've got the little photographic um, index. So it's photographs with just a page number next to it. So you can look at the clouds and just look at that and see which looks most like it, and you get to that page. So I'm wondering about how many points you've got. And, yeah. Uh, well, what, with photographic evidence. Well, well, I mean, it, it must be a bit like climbing Mon Monroe's in that, you know, there must be a type of cloud that you really want to see. In your, your well, there was time. one that I really wanted to see, and then I went and saw it. So, <laughs> uh, I, I mean... Uh, there are ones which I haven't seen that are in the book, that I haven't seen myself. I mean, you know, the ones that the people have sent in the photo garden, I know it, and, I'm, and I would love to see it. So I wouldn't say that, and actually I'm pretty much cubing up photographing the sky. It's a terrible thing, but uh, you get so many of these like, amazing photos that get sent in, you feel a bit discouraged about doing it yourself. I don't mean, know what's had an impotence, the effect of impotence upon me, would have been in terms of taking photographs of the sky. Um, and so, you know, if I was to be put to, uh, asked to come present photographic evidence of how many points I've got, I, you know, it would be fairly sad. But I'm always watching the sky, and I always, I, in a way, I kind of almost prefer just to see it and let it go. Do what I mean? But do you, do you go chasing clouds yourself? Or do you no, it's going, I think it's a bad. I think it's a mistake to go chasing clouds. That kind of goes because you get there and it's a completely blue sky, or it's just totally over. They never do what you want them to do. Uh, and so the thing to do is to be receptive, and just do what you're doing and carry on doing it, and then, but always be kind of have a, 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 a you know, be aware of what's going on above you. And then when you see something unusual, just sort of stop. It's like a moment of meditation. Stop and you kind of tune into it. And that's far, by, in my opinion, by far the best way. I'm not into kind of storm chasing or anything like that. But I know that in that case, there are ways of making sure you're in the right place at the right time. But the general clouds, which don't have such a fanfare as these enormous storm clouds, multi-cell, supercell storms, the normal clouds, you know, you're not going to be able to get them to appear when you want them. So it's much better just to be in a receptive frame of mind and notice them when they appear. I your book really so you can tick them off. Yeah. Having said that, do you, do you ever go on holidays to go and, you know, to particular areas that are good for... Well, I did go um, to see one cloud, and there's one which doesn't really fit that um, rule, which is a cloud called the Morning Glory Cloud, and it forms in the middle of uh, the outback in Australia, northern Queensland. And I was interested in it because, as much as anything, because glider pilots surf it, and it's a long tube of a cloud stretches off longer than Britain itself, hundreds of miles, and you can see it on a satellite photograph. Uh, a long tube of cloud which comes in off the Gulf of Carpentaria, which is this big uh, gulf of uh, sea at the top of Australia. It comes across it and reaches northern Queensland first thing in the morning. It comes through the night, rotating like this as it travels at um, 60 kilometers an hour, 30 miles, 35 miles an hour, something like that. And as it arrives, as it reaches land, it passes over the land for a while, and the glider pilots, at the time of year when it forms, springtime, which is end of September, beginning of October there, they go up in their aeroplanes, and in, in their gliders, and they go along the front of this cloud, because it forms in a wave of air, as a wave again, 
Uh, and it, in a wave of air, it goes like this, and the cloud is rotating in the middle of the wave. And the glider pilots, the, the cloud shows where the wave is, and they go up and down in the rising air at the front. Um, so it's just exactly like ocean wave surfers going up and down it. And, uh, and so I went there to this place, a remote place called Burktown, in the middle of uh, the outback. 178 people live there, flying doctor once a week, um, and sat around waiting for it. A very uh, kind of towards the end of the two weeks I was there, I started getting rather nervous that it wasn't going to come. And in it, you know, it quite possibly wouldn't have come during the time I was there. But it did eventually arrive. I went up in a plane, filmed the gliders doing it. it was amazing. So that's really the one time I've gone somewhere to see a cloud because it's fairly guaranteed, fairly guaranteed that at that time of the year this cloud will fall because of the meteorological conditions that it's causing. Yeah. And given me that, that whole statement, I was just thinking that one thing I missed from your book a little bit when leaping through it quickly is you don't give any weather predictions linked yeah. to if you see this, then this type of, well, where I'm written, is coming. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I talked a bit about that in the, in the previous book, the Cloud Collector's Handbook. But, yeah, I, I considered it, actually. I do talk, in the bottom, uh, the kind of bits on the right, the kind of notes, it does, I think some of them say whether there's, um, whether it's associated with precipitation normally. Um, but I mean, I be, it's the thing is, it's really the point about looking at the clouds for predicting the weather is not about looking at a snapshot of the clouds. It's like if you were to take a random photograph of someone's face, not like a really cheese snap, but if you were to just kind of not be looking and snap it like that, they might be in a bit of a sneezing like that, or you know, they could be in any sort of expression. And the expression they're frozen in at that moment is not necessarily a good indication of the frame of mind that they're in. They might be saying something. You know, like that. And so it's a little bit like that, in my opinion, with the weather. It's to do with watching how it changes. So cirrus clouds, the high wisps, if you see those sitting around, hanging around in the sky and spreading and beginning to join together, the contrails I was talking about, see those spreading out. And you get these high clouds becoming more, you know, more and more of them covering the sky. That's the start of a kind of process of clouds, which usually ends up with the kind of grizzly nimbo stratus cloud uh, some hours later. And so, you know, but if I say, take a photograph of Sirius and I say this one means, you know, rain a few hours later, well, it doesn't, because sometimes it just, they don't, you know, they just kind of evaporate away again. So it's difficult to say that. It's really, I mean, I know what you mean, but there's, there would be a role for that, but I decided not to kind of really put too much emphasis on it. That's it.